holiday edition. That's right. A very rare occurrence where Rob Doster, Terrence Oglesby, and I, John Fanta, are with you for an After Dark episode on this Tuesday night, December 20th. This is like when you watch the local news around Christmas time and they always have the backups in because the, the number ones are, <laughs> are are on vacation. You're like, who's on this show tonight? That's that's what it's come to. Every, apparently everybody else is on Christmas break, but we are we are working and I wore my holiday shirt tonight. On tonight's show, we will welcome in Providence head coach Ed Cooley, who will sing White Christmas. Plus, we'll welcome in a member of the Miami Hurricanes after the Canes just beat Virginia by two showing why they are a top 25 team. But we begin tonight with a wild e evening in the Big East Conference. Heading into the night, you felt like you knew what was likely going to happen. And then Georgetown arrived at the Gamble Pavilion, and Georgetown had what looked like a somewhat controlling lead on the Connecticut Huskies. And then the second-ranked team in the country awoke, and they awoke behind some warmth in the store's cold. Some warmth from Joey Calcaterra, otherwise known as Joey California, Rob Doster, and UConn is 13 and up. Every time I watch Joey California play, I just sit there and I tell myself that that is what Terrence Oglesby thinks that he was when he was in college. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> hey, look, man, the kid has some swagger. You got you to gotta love the performance. I, I do. I do. I, I will it, tell you guys this much. Man. I was I was sweating bullets for about like 15 minutes in the second half, I was sitting there. I was like, I'm really going to have to go on after dark with T.O. and with Fanta after UConn, number one team on Kempom, after UConn going up against Georgetown, who hasn't beat a high major opponent in 27 attempts, goes into Gamble Pavilion and knocks off the Huskies. I was, I was, I was sweating for a minute, but I'll tell you this much. I think that... This was the kind I texted you guys this and you laughed at me. I think that this was the kind of game that UConn needed, right? They are a team that's not going to necessarily beat you with skill. They are a team that needs to win by doing the things that you can control well. What can you control? You can control playing hard. You can control playing with intensity. You control your defensive effort and you control your ability on the glass. When they do those things well, they are the best, one of the best, among the best in the country at it. And when they do those things well, all the other stuff comes with it. You get second chance points. You get points in transition. You get the effort plays. You get the crowd backing you because you have Joey California going and dropping behind the back dimes and Donovan Klingon. If they have to play a possession by possession half court game where they're relying on just their sets to be able to get them offense and just playing in the half court, that's not going to be the way for them to do it. They didn't rebound the ball. Uh, very well in the offensive end. They didn't start playing defense until there were about eight minutes left in that game, and they found a way to get it done. I think that was a wake-up call that they needed. Hey, credit to Georgetown, though. I mean, five guys in double figures battled their butt off on the boards, out-rebounded UConn by 12. I mean, credits where credit's due. I think Georgetown deserves that much. I mean, it's been a rough sled over the past oh, 27 yeah. high major games. But you have to give them some credit there. They <laughs> shared, shared the ball. They played hard. Primo Spears played really well in his first time in stores at, at Gamble. Uh, all of that being said, I, UConn was asleep. And yes, they were. It, they, were they were very uh, lethargic to start out this game. But I, I thought it was promising with the fact that you had some guys, uh, most notably Joey California, was able to come in off the bench and spark that energy. Some of the things that he was doing, uh, energy-giving behaviors, right? Like he provided those, whether it was the behind the back pass, which was an incredible pass. I mean, he sold it perfectly. He went against the grain, threw it back the other way. Like it was a beauty to behold the three, the, the Velcro finish. I mean, it was, it was not a great pass. That he was, was ridiculous. Catch that and go straight up. That's that was ridiculous. That, that, was, was, a, that was a stupid catch and finish. I mean, you know, you know, real quick. I want to go back to the behind the back pass for a second. And cause to me, what made that so impressive was a lot of times when you throw behind the back passes, you're throwing them to be fancy. You're throwing them to be like, watch, this, this is going to be a highlight reel. Watch, this is going to be something that's going to get me on Sports Center. That was the only way he could get the ball there. Yeah. He wasn't was going to be able to lob that thing up. He wasn't going to be able to throw a little pocket pass. He had to throw it behind the back to get it there. And that's, to me, that was what really stood out about that play. But I'm sorry. And he ahead. put it on the deck. Yeah. Like, the, like <laughs> that was a high skill level pass. And th they needed that energy from somebody else. I also thought it was telling uh, Donovan Klingon only played nine minutes. 
just because they go up against a guy in Kudus Wahab, who, who is a tough cover. Now, is Kling going to be able to give you more minutes whenever you play more competitive games? And when I say that, more against teams that are a little bit more skilled in there, uh, are you going to be able to put Kling Kong in there? Uh, I think that's a concern. But overall, I, you have to credit uh, UConn. You have to win games ugly, especially before Christmas, especially in a bit of a sleeper game against a Georgetown team who hasn't won a Big East game in what? 20 games now. So like it, it, credit to UConn, they figured it out. You have to win ugly right before Christmas and you're, you're well, counting your blessings as you go back to the locker room. Yeah. Here's the thing. It was as much adversity as UConn has faced this season. And it's a good thing that it happened tonight Yeah, because for them, it's a piece of humble pie. It's a reminder that you can't just walk into the building in the big East against anybody and just assume that you're going to win. Right. And one and I look at it from this standpoint. UConn for the first time this season tonight went through an extended drought offensively where it wasn't that they were missing shots, it's that they were selecting bad shots. Some of their shot selection was forced, it was pressing, and and it was atypical of what this team has been. Jordan mm-hmm. Hawkins shot 3 of 9 from 3. He start he was trying to hit that game-changing 3. It just didn't come tonight. Tonight is a night where we are reminded of just how deep UConn is, that they were in an offensive rut, and that it's a kid that transferred in from San Diego that made a massive difference in the game. He's not going to do that every night. He might not do that again in Big East play from the standpoint of which he did it tonight because they have a luxury of riches. But UConn, it might have been Georgetown on the other side. I don't care. When they click, and tonight they clicked, Gamble Pavilion was as loud as I have heard any building in college basketball this season. And when they click, guys, UConn is an avalanche team. Mm -hmm. It all comes at once, and there's no way to stop it. It's like an inevitable blizzard. Either you evacuate your area or you sit and you get you know what on. That that's that's the fact of the matter with the Connecticut Huskies. So look, it's a it's a win for them. You have turned the page. They have Villanova up next. It's not the same Villanova. And then they're at Xavier. And then they're at Providence. And I will say, guys, coming out of tonight, watching Providence and, and continuing to watch Xavier, like the Huskies are 13-0. and 0. Now we really are on. When are they going to We're going to know, Fanta, we're going to know exactly what UConn is in the next five games. They get Villanova at home on the 28th. On New Year's Eve, they're at Xavier. On the 4th, they're at Providence. Then they get Creighton at home. Then they're at Marquette. That's the toughest five-game stretch that they're going to have this season by a mile. And I would not – honestly, I would not be surprised if they went 3-2 and two in that stretch. Those are three really tough road games, and you're playing what I would say are probably the mo- two most talented teams in the conference in, in, that, in that stretch at home in, in Villanova and Creighton. So we're going to find out. We're going to find out in those five games. They could be awesome. They look great. They won all these games by double figures. They covered 12 straight games, whatever it is. We are going to find out what they really are in these next five games. You go 5-0 and oh here, and you run through this stretch, yep. then it's a very different conversation. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, we're, right yeah. now, it's just kind of like, yeah, they've been really good. They've been really fun. They've been really promising. They beat the hell out of Alabama. But it's still – there's not there, – there's not a ton of statement wins on that resume, if that makes sense. There's good wins. There's quality mm-hmm. wins. They've yeah, beaten yeah. good teams in impressive ways, but I don't know. We can move hey, on. Hey, Tristan Newton. Tristan night. Newton was good tonight. Yeah, uh, Asa- uh, your boy like, Asan Dr. Too like the energy. Joey made a couple of plays, but the energy really started when they brought in the Asan to, to go be a pest on the ball. He he changed that game. Well, play. and the, yeah, the and there was a couple actually, times like Georgetown had some brutal turnovers. Like when, when UConn started pressing to try they to do that. Yeah, they had some like a cook. A cook just threw it right to UConn. Like yes. he he must have forgot where he was at. Like. No, <laughs> There's some Cleveland Browns elements to them. They, mm-hmm. they, yeah, they, they yeah I mean, it was it. tough. But those point guards gave energy. But Tristan Newton, like, he's kind of the forgotten guy for a little bit. And he ends up with 17 and 7. So you have to be happy for him as well. All right, let's transition to Providence and Marquette. Game of the night in college basketball. Oh, great game. A double overtime thriller. Providence, 103. Marquette, 98 in double OT. By the way, coming up on the show, if you're watching and wondering what's what's happening, Ed Cooley's coming up. We got an interview with Ed Cooley. You will hear him sing. He had a very powerful message about what he told his guys after the win tonight that we'll get to in a moment. And, Rob, who do we have at 1130 coming on the show? 
It'll be someone from Miami. I'm not exactly sure yet. Uh, rumor has it it could be Jordan Miller. It could be Isaiah Wong. It could be Nigel Pack. It could be uh, SID Alex Schwartz. I don't know. It's going to be one of those things. Remember when we got surprised by uh, by K- Cam Jones a couple of weeks ago? Who was up? Were you on with me then, T.O.? We got surprised yeah. by Cam Jones. It's going to be one yeah. of those nights, man. You never you never know what you're going to get on the field of 68 after dark. That's the beauty. I like it. Can we do our toast tonight, by the way? Because I think uh, since we're getting well, wait into a minute. this game. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, since we're getting into this game, might as well. Does is anybody going to toast anything other than Bryce Hopkins tonight? No. Uh, you know what? Yeah, yeah. I'll let you two do Bryce Hopkins. I'll go Alan Breed. Uh, Bryce Hopkins. Look, he got me. He got me wearing a shirt. Providence fans. He got me wearing a shirt. The Friars lucky shirt. There was nothing lucky about that. I like wearing a shirt because I want you to buy it. I want to sell some merch. There was nothing lucky about that. Twenty nine points, twenty three boards. What a monster! How much? I hope there's no Kentucky fans watching this right now. That's all I got to say. He was tough, man. He was tough. It, it was one thing after another, and that big, strong physical presence. Like, he's so fast. And it's not just like he's a big, strong dude, but it's his speed with that power that makes him such a difficult matchup for whoever he's going to play. Eight offensive boards, 15 defensive boards. Like, he yep. was a monster. But I'm going to toast Alan Breed. You know why? His stats aren't the loudest. But, like, the dude defends his butt off, and he hit arguably the biggest shot of the night. Like, yes, it, that, that corner three that he had – like, he's always been a role player, but he's a damn good role player. He guards. He, he doesn't complain when other guys are getting shots up. Like, I, I really enjoy watching him play because he's a quality piece, and you need guys like that to have a good ball team. couple of notes on this win for the Friars. They are now 29-1 and one in their last 30 games at Amica Mutual Pavilion. 29-1. and one. A number of ranked wins in there. They have been a dominant force inside that building, which has become a house of horrors, a place where ranked teams go to die. Trivia question, who's the one? Who's the one team that beat Providence inside that building? Villanova, and I was sitting right beside you, John Fanta. Colin Gillespie beat them, and it was unbelievable. But the Friars have won 29 of 30 games inside the Amp. In addition to that, Bryce Hopkins tonight had 29 and 23. He is the first player in a Big East game to have a 2020 game since Angel Delgado of Seton Hall in 2017. Oh, that's a good stat. It's a, it's that's a been, good fact. It has been close to five years since we've seen a 2020 game in the Big East, and Hopkins had it, and this is his second Big East game. He is now realizing the type of stud that he can be. Ed Cooley's done this with LaDante Henn. He's done it with other four men, and he's doing it with, with Hopkins now. It's almost as if the Al Skinner flex and Cooley set set up well for a versatile four to make plays, to catch it on, on the elbow, make things happen. And guys, Ed Croswell is starting to perform like the man that he is. He's now really relishing in the fact that he's got to be what Nate Watson was to the Friars last year. And, and very suddenly, Providence, a team that was 8-3 and three heading into Saturday, and we're sitting there saying, they haven't done anything really to, to bolster themselves. They, they're not a tournament team right now. Look what four days can, can do. They went to Seton Hall. They were down nine at the half. It looked bleak. They won that game. Tonight, they're up. Excuse me. They're down 76-68 to 68 with four minutes to go in regulation. Jeff Goodman texted our group and said, Providence has a one-way ticket to the NIT. Well, Jeff, just like last year, you were wrong. <laughs> and Providence proceeded to go on a 20 to four run. This game goes into overtime and Providence finds a way to win in that building. They have, they have a true home court advantage. It is. That's, one of those- that's what they do, man. Like I, I, at some point, I, I know, look, I got the lucky shirt. I, I, I know we love to say this. I know we love, we love to joke about it, but Ed leads all the way into that. And you're going to see him do it in this interview with him in a second, but there is, there's something about, the level of confidence and level of belief that that team has in that building, that they're going to find a way to do it. And, and um, Tio, you, you could probably attest this better than me, but there is, there's something about having the mindset of, okay, we're in a bad spot. How are we going to figure out a way to get this done as opposed to, Oh man, um, you know, we did it again. We blew it again. Or, you know, Oh, we're up by eight uh, with, five minutes left uh, a lot of that has to do with Cooley now because Cooley goes into those games and say hey you just get me to those last two minutes I'll get you there and the fact Mm -hmm. that he says that means a lot and that's why he was Naismith national coach of the year last year Fanta and here is the stat of the night America here's the stat that's better than the other two numbers 
since 2013, Terrence and Rob, in games decided by five points or less for Providence, they have played 100 games, 100 games decided by five points or less in the last nine years, 100. Ed Cooley's record is 71 and 29. Holy hell. He wins that, 71% of the games that he's involved in that are decided by five points or less. That's it. That, that's an incredible stat. And it says a lot of, about coaching. It says a lot about coaching and instilling confidence in your players, both. Both. Mm -hmm. And we caught up with him after the game for an interview that is not only great post game, but a holiday treat. in double overtime over the Golden Eagles. And we are joined by head coach Ed Cooley now from the locker room. Ed, how would you describe the game that you just coached in? Uh, emotional game, um, great game. Uh, very proud of our men. I thought it was two teams that felt like a, and honestly felt like an eight, nine game in the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, it was, you know, push and go the whole way. I just was really proud of the group as I'm seeing a team grow right before our eyes. We're, we're way better than we were a couple of weeks ago, and I thought we're starting to build an identity where we're trying to go. Bryce Hopkins, he, he wasn't an animal. He was a manimal. Like, 29 and 23, eight offensive boards. He, he was nonstop tonight. Uh, speak on his uh, maturation through the early part of this season heading into conference play. Well, so, you know, when you look at Bryce's development over the period of time, so his senior year, this COVID year, I think he plays 12 games, high school games, goes to a school, doesn't play in a role of which, you know, you know, he had consistent minutes, you know, mm -hmm. he was a limited minute guy. So he's still growing and developing. And we've been talking about this the whole time. We see it in practice a lot. I think he had a couple of very, very unselfish plays that he could have taken. One was a kick out three to uh, breed uh, in the second half. Honestly, he had a slip and it was a layup for him, yet he was unselfish. He continues to get better, and he's playing both ends of the floor, which I'm really proud of him on. Ed, I don't want to ruin uh, the upcoming Christmas holiday, but I just want to let you know I did get you a Christmas gift. It's going to be one of these. It's going to be coming in the mail. My, you know what? You can call me the luckiest guy in the world. I love it. I love the shamrock. I love the fact that you got fryers on. I appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. So the – the the dunk or the I guess it's called the amp now. I'm always going to be calling it the dunk. That that no, place is really what, become. No, we, we, we got to give our naming rights people all the love and we're Amica Mutual Pavilion, right? <laughs> the amp. We got to give them their love. I mean, it was called the old name, but right now Amica Mutual Pavilion, baby. It worked well, out what tonight. It, what it, whatever it is, it's a fortress now. So what is it like the, um, playing in front of that kind of atmosphere and that kind of? It's, the place where people are intimidated to go to to play to officiate to to you know sit on the sideline to be a media member like Jeff Goodman. So it's a tough place. It's been a place over the years that we've been here. This is my twelfth season here, and every single year, I say it gets edgier and edgier. And last year was a pinnacle as far as you know attendance. We, you know we're over eleven thousand season ticket holders now. It's just a credit to our AD, his his team the student body, and then all the supporters that come out. I mean, the people here love the Friars. And I hope we can continue to play well for them and improve. Well, it's a credit to you too, Coach. I think that's that's a huge part of it, very obviously. But I had the privilege to call your game earlier this season against Stonehill. And before the game, you talked about, you know, this team is still developing, but we've got pieces. I mean, how mm -hmm. nice is it to see as a coach, they're starting to form together. I mean, guys are embracing the roles and, and continue to uh, – you know, develop within those roles. And then you're doing a nice job molding these guys together. I mean, you have to be proud of what's happening as far as that's concerned. I'm very proud. You know, I give our staff a lot of credit. You know, we sit down, as you know, as a coach, you talk about your player personnel all the time. What can they, okay, let's put the players in their strengths. Everybody worries about what a player can't do. I'm somebody who values strengths of individuals. And as players, put them in their strength. So many people worry about, well, I got to work on this. Well, you don't get paid for doing what you don't do well. You get paid for what you do, do well. And that's what we try to concentrate as a staff. So, you know, all the credit goes to the players and the staff. Ed, I can't help but look at your program and heard you in an interview this past week say, with our program, I want everybody that's touching it, whether it be a support staff member, a fan, 
anyone who's involved in Providence College basketball, you want them to feel like they're important. That's how you are. That's who you are. With the Christmas season upon us, the the holidays in, in full swing, just how much do you try to relay that to your players to take nothing for granted and, and that it does go beyond basketball when you're at Providence College? It's funny, you know, you know, just before we were just before we addressed the team after the game, I told them, hey guys, take for a minute and appreciate the moment. Appreciate the holiday season. Appreciate that young men and women are not going to have Santa Claus that arrive to their house. Appreciate the fact that we're going to take care of our bodies because so many young men and women right now during the holidays, there are drinking and driving accidents. There are things that happen to your body when you're not taking care of it. I love people and I love people that care about other people. Do the right thing and you can never go wrong. And I know it sounds like corny, but I just appreciate every moment and every opportunity that I have on this earth to make other people feel loved, wanted, supported by what we do here at Providence College in our men's basketball program. Ed Cooley, one of the absolute best. The Friars are 10-3, and three, a 103, 98 win over Marquette. And Ed, you know this better than anybody. That's a 2-0 and o start in the Big East. And I know you'll take that eight days a week with how this league can be. Oh, my goodness. The eggnog is going to be good. <laughs> Jingle Bells is going to be on blast. I'm going to sing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. I, I, you know, I love the holiday seasons because it's about giving. And I'm looking forward to spending the next couple of days with my family and those that I love. Merry Christmas to all of you. Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. And I appreciate everything that you guys do for college basketball. Thank you, Ed. Happy holidays, Ed. Appreciate Happy you. Holidays. Appreciate, appreciate you. you. Much love, family. He's saying why Christmas. He said the eggnog will be flowing. Ed Cooley is God's gift to the world. <laughs> and there's just no better fit to a program than Ed is to Providence. And they've got it going again. They've made seven of the last nine NCAA tournaments, guys. And, and it's, in, it's within the realm of reason to think that they can make another. All right. Let's turn to Marquette, who lost this game. 103 to 98. There's a lot being made post game about the free throw disparity in this game, which was at 49 to 19 tonight, which is a pretty large discrepancy. Rob Doster, your reaction to that? It's life on the road in the Big East, right? Like, I, I think that there are probably going to be nights when uh, Shaka's team, the way that they play, uh, when they're at the, what is it, the five serve forum? Now I can never keep track of the names of these. Uh, these facilities, the Pfizer Forum, there's going to be nights where they have this level of free throw advantage. Uh, I, I'm not – I don't think that Marquette necessarily got a friendly whistle tonight. If anyone had an advantage, it's Providence, but it's not something where I'm sitting here like, this is egregious, you need to uh, – this needs to be investigated, this, that, and the third. It just – it's college basketball, man. It's life on the road. Things well, if happen. you look if you look at the two that took 30 free throws together, Bryce Hopkins and, and Devin Carter, those are two rim attack dudes. And a lot goes into, hey, you're at Providence. You're not going to get the benefit of the doubt when you're playing at the AMP. Like, it's just not going to happen. Same could be said for the Pfizer Forum. Like, not an easy place to play there either. You're likely to get the the whistle at home. Uh, All of that being said, the more aggressive team towards the rim typically gets more foul calls. And it sounds kind of weird. Like, the more physical team, uh, typically you would think, like, they're going to get called fouls on more. Not the case. The more aggressive you are towards the rim, the more you're going to get. And that's what happened tonight with Carter and Hopkins. The rest, you know, it it doesn't really matter as much. Croswell, he always gets fouled one way or another. But with Hopkins and Carter, the way that they play with their aggressiveness and assertiveness, getting to the rim, they're going to get foul calls. And that's just, it's just going to happen. And it just happened more tonight than it has on previous nights. Look, that's life, folks. You you, you go on the road in this conference, you're not going to get a friendly whistle. Tyler Kolek is a killer. That kid is something something else. I mean, what he, he did in that first overtime was amazing, Fanta. Sorry to oh, interrupt you. He single handedly willed his team back into the game. They were down 88 to 80. It looked like Marquette was going to throw the towel, and Kolek just pressed Providence by himself. Marquette's going to be fine. They're, they're, they're going to be They're fine. a really good team, man, with the way they can space the floor and spread it out. They're, they're a really yeah. good team. Tough loss, but. You know, they've Good got Seton Hall next, and unfortunately, yep. Seton Hall is going to be a bit of a punching bag this year because they they just 
They, they keep coming up close, but they fall tonight to Xavier by three as the Musketeers move to 2-0 and in the Big East. Let's turn to the ACC. What a game. What a game in the ACC. Miami and Virginia play into a tight one. Top 25 matchup in the conference, and Miami takes it, guys, and they take it by two. Jim Laranaga's team showed tonight why they were ranked in the top 25. 66-64, to a huge night for Isaiah Wong. He goes for 24 points. Terrence Oglesby, how did Miami win this game? Well, it's a reoccurring theme. If you play against Virginia and you have individual playmakers, you're going to be able to have some success. And Miami has that with Isaiah Wong. Isaiah Wong's the reason they made it to the Elite Eight last year. But it, it comes from some of these other guys, too. Norchad Ormier. 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 <laughs> We're going to get it. We're going to get it. Ormier. Uh, he was good, too. And he's been better for Miami than what I thought he was going to be. And, and I thought he would be good. But I also thought there would be some issues there because I thought Sam Wardenberg was very important to last year's Miami team because he could space the floor. He could make some decisions. Uh, Omier has done a lot of the same thing. So it's hard for me to uh, really talk bad about anything this Miami team's doing. Yeah, the the way that they can kind of make plays off the bounce and the guys exactly. that have in the backcourt and our guards, it's, it's going to take a lot for me not to be convinced that um, – that Miami is the best team in the ACC right now. And the only way that you could probably do it to you is if you go on one of your spiels and you set up your soapbox and you set up your stool and you take a couple steps up and you get to that soapbox and you set up your sure microphone and you sit here and you say, Virginia tech is the best team in the ACC. That's but the I also only think, way like, I think it- does, does Miami win this game at Virginia? Like that's my, that's my only counter to that. No, like, they, they don't. No, they don't. Right. They don't, but that's also life in conference play. Exactly. And- right. That's that's just how it is. I mean, will will Miami take a return trip to to Charlottesville? Uh, I got to check that. I'd thing. be curious I, to I'd be curious to know that. Here's the deal. Here's the deal with Miami. They had some significant losses with McGusty and more, but but as much as their off season, everybody remembers their off season starting with drama. Don't tell me that didn't influence what people thought this team was going to be heading into the season. Guess what? The kids got paid. And they've mm-hmm. put all that. They're, they're playing together. They're mm. playing as one. And we should have known that because you have a 600-plus game winner in Jim Laranega who found something last year. Isaiah Wong is a killer and has been for a long time for that program. Like, Wong has put together a great career in Miami backcourt history. Yeah. Seriously, yep. that's that's how that's how great he has been throughout his career. Hey, for the people listening, quick quick programming note: Jordan Miller from uh, from Miami. He's been kind of their breakout star this year. I know RC loves him. He's going to be joining us in about five minutes. They are currently uh, in the presser, so as soon as they're done in the press conference, they'll be um, they'll be here. Great. So, to, six, thank thanks for that note. Jordan Miller's coming up. Sixty six, sixty four. Miami wins this game. You know. The thing about the Hurricanes is we know what that guard play is. But to defend the way that they've been defending, I thought tonight, Terrence, that they defended at a pretty high level. Like, I thought that they played. And and don't tell me that it's because Virginia is not a great offensive team. Their perimeter defense was on point. They held Virginia to 26% from beyond the arc. And they evened up Virginia on the glass. And, and that's where, to your point on Omir, Omir's rebounding the basketball at a high level. He is really it is. Po- Poplar's? Hey, he had six rebounds tonight. Wong had six. They're re- they, they, they gang rebounded. If you're going to beat Virginia, you have got to match their toughness level. And I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people's perception of Miami is, yeah, they've got some – really good guards who make things happen and are going to make your life tough. But at the end of the day, you could just, they don't have the same toughness as other teams. I'm telling you folks. And Terrence, I think you'd agree. Miami has sneaky toughness. Their big issue is the, is the rim protection inside, but like they got, they got some dudes and, and look, they have the toughness up here, right? Like they they got, they are old guys that are going to make. Omir had four blocks now. Like, just because he's not seven foot doesn't mean he's not protecting the rim. 
Yeah, but I mean, four blocks. Wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> That, that's that's a little bit of an outlier for what he's been this season. Like, if, do you think that they have good? He's not, he's not Ryan Kalkbrenner. He's not Walker Kessler. He's not someone that you're getting out and pressing and funneling people to. Man, me and Tio just been what was heads all was day. It, what was Tio, me and Tio can't, can't stocks, agree on almost three today. stocks a game. Isn't that what you call it, Fanta? Three well, stocks for, a the, game? for the record, for the record, we are on hour four of collective coverage today. <laughs> We did a show this morning with Jeff Goodman and John Henson. Henson has golfed around, drank probably 12 beers, went back, went to some steakhouse for a tremendous dinner, is back home, and if he's not asleep, he's doing something, something, and then he's going to go to bed. That guy has had an amazing day, incredible day, and producer Dagan we're on hour four of programming today. We did two and a half hours of DTF podcasting earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and when does that come out? Tomorrow? Tomorrow morning. That, the, tomorrow the audio, morning. The audio, the audio would have already been out, except that we had to wait. Uh, Phantom wanted us to all hang out and chat before we got Cooley on his own. Oh, it was fun. It was fun. So, <laughs> so, here's, so here's the thing. How would you guys power rank the ACC. Give me your top three teams. I threw in a third there. Give me your top three teams at this moment. I th- I still think I would probably have Virginia third, right? After seeing what what Duke's performance was today, and I know they didn't have Whitehead, and I know they, they didn't have Lively, but it, it's 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 hard for me to back a team when Jeremy Roach goes on the road and has the performance that he had tonight. So I think I would probably have Virginia third. North Carolina fourth. I know you didn't ask for a top four, but it's Miami, Virginia Tech to me right now with uh, Virginia third. I still think if you want to talk about ceiling, T.O., North Carolina and Duke have the highest ceiling if it all comes together, but it ain't all together right now. We'll be getting to Duke later in the show. Uh, I'm still going. Um, let's see. Virginia Tech's 11 and one as well. It just depends on where they play. Now, yeah, but come on. here's my think, big thing. Wait a minute. Do you, do you think Virginia Tech is better than Virginia? Right now, no. yeah. I don't think so overall. Right now, don't, yeah. don't take into account a loss to Houston and hold it against them. I also think the spurt ability of, of Virginia Tech could put them over the top in quick, fast, and in a hurry. I mean, look at the ACC tournament last year, and they're playing the same style with some, a lot of the same dudes. So, like, they could get hot against Virginia's ordeal as far as – you know, how they play and, and getting all these threes and they can knock down shots. Like Armand Franklin went over three from three and over seven from the field tonight. Like, and he has been consistent in doing that. So like, how are you going to, you know, catch up with Virginia Tech's spurtability? By the way, Sean Crawley in the chat just said, Goodman would find fault with the 1990 UNLV team. <laughs> That's a good point. That is so freaking good. That is a great line. What else? We have a bunch of UConn is coming from Reginald Burden. I don't think UConn's coming anymore. I, I think it's very much here. Um, well, you, you should, yeah, you should look at the chat, not that chat, the the Zoom, Zoom chat. chat. Jordan Miller's here waiting for us while you're sitting here reading the YouTube oh. chat. Well, let's welcome him in then. Let's welcome <laughs> in Jordan Miller. Let's welcome in Jordan Miller. Jordan Miller, who had 11 points, five rebounds. Miami wins it 66 to 64 over Virginia. Jordan Miller is with us now. Jordan, John Fancy here with you, as well as Terrence Oglesby and Rob Dowster as well. Man, 66 to 64, a victory over the Cavaliers. How would you define the way that your team went into this game with the plan to face Virginia and how you executed it to beat them? Yeah, um, you guys can hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Uh, we knew it was going to be a war going into this game. Um, Virginia, even though they lost to Houston, Houston's a very good team. Um, and, you know, they were going to be looking for redemption. Uh, I think the game plan was, was was put together very well. And I think we all knew that every possession was going to matter. And so our focus defensively, because, again, like our, our offense has never really been a problem, but it's defensively. Can we get enough stops to win these games? Um, but I think, you know, it came down to being focused on every possession and us executing the game plan. Hey, Jordan, you know, I, I think what you do for this team is really admirable. 
and you, you just continue to stuff the stat sheet and you don't get all the, the accolades that Isaiah Wong gets. I mean, speak on your ability because you were a good player at George Mason. I mean, you had some massive games after your previous stop. The ability to buy into a role and why that was important for you whenever you came to Miami and you're now starting to get, you know, notoriety for that. Yeah, um, you know, I would describe my game as not the flashiest and, you know, everybody loves the flashy stuff, but I just try to make sure night and night out, whatever my team needs, I'll be able to provide. Um, I like to see, say that I'm a uh, jack of all trades, um, humbly, of course. And so whatever the team needs, I feel like I'll be able to provide that night. Sometimes, some nights it's scoring, some nights it's rebounding, you know, getting steals, assists, whatever it is. Um, I just try to, you know, help any way I can. Jordan, you don't have to be humble on the field of 68 after dark. I appreciate your effort to be humble. You don't have to be humble here. This is where we we, we kind of let loose. Um, I, I do want to ask you about Isaiah Wong and, and kind of Nigel as well, but specifically Isaiah because he was there last year. When you have a guy that you know, you know, if things aren't going well offensively, maybe if you guys are in a little bit of a rut, you can just give him the rock and he can go get one. What, what what kind of is, is that like a pressure release for you guys? Like what how how comforting is it to know when things kind of get bogged down? You still got this guy that can just go create on his own. Yeah, um, I would say it it, it helps us knowing it, it makes everybody's job easier. Uh, it makes our us scoring easier because every team is so focused on stopping Isaiah Wong that um, it helps everybody else. And so he doesn't even know he's helping us, but he's helping us. Um, and him just being able to, at the end of a play, you know, just go one on one, it's just something spectacular. I think we're all just witnessing um, a pro, honestly. Um, and you know, there's a lot of plays for Zay for him to just get comfortable and do whatever he needs to do. And I think he's so far he's been delivering, and I wouldn't be surprised if he keeps doing it. And we're not trying to shortchange you here, Jordan. Like we realize some of your other games now, like 25 against NC State, 22 against Cron- like you've gotten it done too. It's just your ability to meld, like mesh around all these other guys is something that's so commendable because you do what's needed on a given night. And tonight it was meant to be some of the other things. And I think that's what makes you so good and what brings value to that Miami team because you have guys that do everything and you guys are going to be right in a mix of it again, second second weekend, whatever. Like Miami is that good and they're here to stay and you're a huge part of it. So I just want to make sure that you understand that humbly, of course. Make sure you understand that humbly. <laughs> He's got it. Hey, He's got it. Here's my question to you. Your coach, Jim Laranaga, reached a milestone this year, hitting his 600th win. He's had a terrific, terrific career. Tell us a story about Coach Laranaga or a saying Something that comes to your mind, Jordan Miller, that you could tell us tonight. Um, something that comes to my mind is we need a rebound. I mean, last year and this year, he's been saying it so much that I, I, I I'll probably dream about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but you know, L Coach L, uh, he he recently just hit that milestone. Um. To me, what's incredible is that he's ready for every situation. Um, obviously, he's older. Um, he called himself ancient. I didn't. He called himself ancient. Um, <laughs> but he, there's so many. He, he's never worried. He's so calm because he's he's seen it all before. Now, my, my, my thought process with that is, here's the deal. You know this, okay? I'm not going to name any names. But there are other ancient coaches out there. Okay. There are other, you know what I mean? If this guy's ancient, okay. Like he says he is. What is it about him that allows him to be in touch with you guys? I think it's the trust he puts in us. Um, He's not one of those coaches that's going to be, he doesn't scream and yell all the time. Um, Well, a little bit more this year because we got some freshmen and some new pieces, but for the (laughs) most part, like when I first got here, I was surprised about how um, relaxed he was. And I, I don't mean to say that and be like, oh, he's, he doesn't get on us. Like, he gets on us. But I think it's the trust that he puts into us. And um, when he needs to yell, he'll yell. But for the most part, it's very calm. And I think for us, it allows us to feel, like, comfortable and at, at ease almost. You know what I mean? How All many right. degrees do you have now, Jordan? Just just out of <laughs> curiosity, how many degrees do you have at this point in your college career? Hey, I'm still working on my bachelor's. When I when I transferred, 
uh, I messed up my credits, and so it took me back a year. So, um, but I should be graduating in the spring. Finally. Hey, that, that that's so, tough, but man, you, you're going to be successful in whatever it is you'd like to do after basketball's over, man. You, you really represent yourself well. I want you to know that. And hey, if I was going to school in Miami, I probably would need about five or six years. <laughs> He'd be at FAU. He wouldn't be at Miami. He'd be at FAU. All right, Jordan. I got to ask you this question here. Christmas is Sunday. What is the best Christmas gift that Jordan Miller has ever gotten? That I've ever gotten? Ever. I'm going to be honest. So when I was in eighth grade, I had um, a, um, uh, an LG Cosmos. It was like a little flown. You, you flip it up and it had the little keyboard. But mm -hmm. I, I wanted an iPhone so bad. Like everybody at school was having an iPhone. And I was like, I want that. You know what I mean? You know how kids are. Um, and my parents kept it from me. Uh, and I was asking for so long. But my parents were like, no, we're not getting you an iPhone. Are you crazy? You know, they really, they really got me. Christmas Day. Open it. I see the iPhone logo. Man, I was going nuts. I was going nuts. So that definitely is the best gift that I've got. That's what I'm talking about. That is what I'm talking about, Jordan Miller. Are you able to spend Christmas home? Yes, I will be going home. It's funny. We're playing Virginia, and I'm going to be going to Virginia on a flight to Virginia tomorrow. So, hey, at least we got the dub, though. Makes me feel a whole lot better. Yeah, You're I was going to say, they're probably gonna not, not going to let you on the flight now after that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you're flying home with the dub for Christmas, which is great. Jordan Miller, we appreciate your time tonight. And as T.O. And, and Rob both said, you really represent yourself well. So it's way to be man and, and way to embrace the jack of all trades role. Because I love that you said that. There's not enough college basketball players who think that way, and you do. So thanks for the time. Uh, be less humble. Tell Alex I said it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy, wait, wait, wait. You have a midnight snack here now? You're going to get get a quick snack here? You got to get a snack. Uh, I don't. I got. I still have to go home and pack. So right now, honestly, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about. He's thinking, me. get me off this interview, guys. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I like interviews. It's it's been great. You guys are very relaxed, very chill. Like it's definitely, you know, it's not as like answer this, answer that. You guys are laughing. It's it's just a good vibes. <laughs> we have fun. Hey, good luck with the packing. It stinks. Packing is <laughs> the worst. Good good luck with that. Merry Christmas. I appreciate it. Merry Christmas to Merry you. Merry Christmas. Also. Thanks, Jordan. Jordan Miller, and we thank Miami. We thank the U tonight. The U gets a big win over Virginia in the ACC. I'll tell you what. Um, you want to know about Jim Laranega? Just listen to that interview. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Right? How many times, T.O., do you hear a kid today say he's embracing being a jack-of-all-trades for a team? That doesn't happen often. And I had this conversation with a, with a young man the other day, like, everybody's looking at what's next and what is something over there is always shinier or nicer. Like, and I say that about Jordan Miller, of course he transferred, but that being said, like his ability to form in a role with that Miami team and for him to embrace that role uh, is huge because it, we know who Miami's main scorer is. It's Isaiah Wong and his ability to play off of him has increased his value and therefore increased his team's value. And one of the main reasons why Miami's so good. Well, it's a great win for the Hurricanes, and they are for real, and they are a threat to make another run come March. A team to really watch here going forward. Here's the other thing that happened tonight in the ACC. Wake Forest 81, Duke 70. Rob Dowster, what happened to the Blue Devils? Well, for starters, they were missing Derek Lively and Derek Whitehead, and that's never going to make things uh, easier for you. Um, but I, I just, I think going on the road is, was they got a little bit of a wake up call, right? Like Kyle Filipowski was not the guy that we've seen for the first, whatever, five weeks of the season, four for 14, um, nine, bo uh, nine points over six from three. Um, I think Jeremy Roach kind of got a little bit of a, a, a taste of what road life is going to be like in the ACC, but my biggest takeaway here, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, like, okay. Duke was missing a couple of their best players. They're probably not a top 10 team like we thought they were going to be. But Wake Forest always does this to somebody, right? They always find some way to get a win over one of the Blue Bloods in that conference or knock off Virginia. They always do this one or two times at home, no matter how bad they are, right? Even in the worst Danny Manning years, they still found a way to, to, to <laughs> at least put a scare into some people, right? Like This is just what they do at home in Winston-Salem. And 
Uh, but it's I, a big win for Wake Forest, regardless. This is their second win. quad one win. Like, huge like win. that's that's one more than they had last year. Mm -hmm. it's the, so, this is the kind of win that could honestly, like when we come down to Selection Sunday, this is the kind of win that can get you on the right side of the bubble. And it's the kind of win that could take you from being in a playing game to being outside of a playing game, to being like a, a 10 or 11 seed, right? 100%. Yeah. And, and Tyree Appleby was huge in this game. He, he comes up big, as, as you would expect him to do so. Steve Forbes has a bucket in him. And Wake Forest scored the basketball really well tonight against a Duke defense. Look, lively, whitehead or not, Duke's defended. It's, mm -hmm. it's really been a given that they're going to play defense, no matter who's out there, because they've had that length. And they've disrupted what teams are trying to do offensively. So you give yep. Steve Forbes a lot of credit. Steve Forbes has changed the complexion of Wake Forest rather quickly. He's a really good coach. And when you take a look at how in sync that they were tonight, you're able to score 81 points. Look, it's a team that they got an opportunity tonight mm -hmm. to beat Duke. When you get Duke, Carolina, Virginia, Virginia Tech in your building, and for that matter, Miami, in the ACC this year, if you're a team that's around the bubble conversation, you're going to have to win those games because it's what separates you from making it and missing it. And tonight, Wake Forest capitalized. They salvaged the opportunity, and you got to give a lot of credit to what Wake did defensively on Jeremy Roach. They cut off the head of the snake. How As worried are you guys about that? Like, uh, about kind of Roach in general? Because, I mean, Fancy, you were you were pessimistic on him in the season. You caught some unnecessary flack from Duke fans. But he he hasn't been – he's had moments. I'm not he surprised at all. He hasn't taken that that leap that I think a lot of a lot of people thought that he was going to take, right? Yeah. I thought, I thought he would take a huge leap. I, I really did because he was kind of that reoccurring theme. But, guys, let, let's keep in mind, like, he hasn't been awful. He just hasn't shot the ball well. I mean, he's, he's 13, three and a half, and two and a half. So, I mean, those aren't terrible numbers. And he's do, he's getting those three and a half assists without two of his better players. And Derek Whitehead, once he gets healthy, he's going to be very helpful. Now, Lively, I'm starting to fall in and out a little bit because he's in there and he's just there because I think other guys command a lot more respect. But that rim presence and that alley-oop threat, like I, that's going to help some. But I think the Dariq Whitehead being back, uh, that, that's going to be huge for them. But I feel like we'd be remiss, guys, if we didn't talk about Wake Forest's Cam Hildreth a little bit. Because I, if, if I were going to pick a guy that was going to surprise some guys, I probably would have gone with Andrew Carr, a Delaware yes. transfer. I probably yeah. would have gone with uh, Bobby Clintman. Uh, a freshman from Sweden, like those two guys, they popped off the page whenever I went and watched them in practice. Kim Hildreth is just big physical English guard, like Papa Red over there. And he has improved so much. He's one of the most improved players in the Atlantic Coast Conference. And he's averaging good numbers. Uh, and he, right at 12 and six boards as a point guard, he's 6'4", 200. Like he's a big dude and he's mm -hmm. rebounding and giving them value in other ways than just scoring and this little six foot floater i talked to a friend of mine ashley hamilton he's a british guy that i played against years ago he played at loyola marymount and he was ended up being a really good player he called me when cam committed he was like hey he might not be good his first year but he just finds a way and he's big he's strong he's and he just finds a way and boy has he ever and he is that reliable player Beside a Tyree Appleby, who's a, who's a bit of a lightning rod, guys. He's a, Tyree Appleby is a bit of a lightning rod. Cam Hildreth is this steadying presence who just kind of find ways to be effective. So kudos to him. It, kudos to Wake Forest. That's a massive win for that program. It, it reminds me, and correct me if I'm wrong here, CEO, because this could be completely off and I could be completely talking out of my ass, which is very much a possibility and it's something that I do quite a We've bit. We've done a lot of shows today. We've done a lot of shows. It, it reminds me a little bit of the dynamic. They're different players, but it reminds me of the dynamic of Alondis Williams and Jake LaRavia last year, where you had one guy that was that you knew could go and take over a game, right? You had one guy that if you needed someone to be able to maybe create a little bit in isolation and maybe, maybe be able to get in the lane and create something for somebody else, that was your star, your go-to guy, whatever you want, label you want to put on, you got a guy like that. Then you had this other guy that would just kind of, made everything else work because he could do a lot of things well, right? So you kind of have that. It's almost like a Batman and a Robin 
in, in a sense. Yeah, my, I mean, my, to my, a point, my, yeah, absolutely. Where Batman's jumping off the buildings, Robin's down there with the well, with the yeah. safety net kind of deal. Yeah, and, and tonight, don't forget about Matthew Marsh. Yeah, because, the, the the big Brit man, the big know, Brit. He went he went five for five tonight. He did not miss, and and he gets looks right around the rim. But at seven foot one, like he's a guy who's taken a leap as well. They they have developed. Their pieces have developed. Has there ever been a college basketball team that had two British stars on it? Two British starters? I don't know about that. I'm sure there has been. I'm sure what there's you, a lot of good players. You know what? We got to we got to get these guys on because I want to know what their first reaction was the first time that they met Forbes. What was and it? You, Forbes said. What was it? Forbes said after. Uh, what was it? Forbes said after he said he, he's sitting with Bean. Was it Beans and Mash? Yeah. <laughs> beans like and oh, Bangers and Mash. Yeah, Bangers yeah. and Mash. Sorry, Bangers and Mash. Like yeah, he he had him beside him. I, I thought that was pretty cool. No, I have never watched Batman, but you get my drift. You knew what I was saying back there. Just just imagine, just imagine Forbes going over to uh to Crowey, England, and sitting down with Matthew Marsh's family and having a cup of tea. <laughs> just, just I really just like that image in your head. I really like Forbes. Like. I'd like to hit a buffet with him. <laughs> He's on a diet now, man. Is he? Know. Yeah. Is he? Well, <laughs> if, he, if he crossed me, wouldn't be. I'll tell you um, that much. So the, I will take the, a break. The chat, the chat is really enjoying the fact that T.O. just said beans and mash. Ah, bangers and mash. My bad. It's so My bad. bad tires. Yeah, tires. Tires and tears. It's, it's late. And <laughs> it's and late. And, and there and were a mash. lot of good games. It were, there were a lot of good games tonight. A lot of good games. Hey. We do have to hit on this out of the many good games we watched. One of the lone unbeatens is no more. Mississippi State took a loss for the very first time tonight. They fell 58-52 to to a good Drake team. But the Bulldogs are no longer unbeaten. They do fall for the first time. Any thoughts on Drake pulling it off over Miss State? I have more thoughts on, well, one, that's really good for Drake and the chances they could end up being an at-large team heading into the uh, NCAA tournament, but like Mississippi state was flirting with this for a while, right? They had, um, they beat nickel state by two at home. They struggled with a Jackson state team. That wasn't very good. Like they've, they've not been great um, for the last, uh, probably the last week or two. So I'm not super surprised. Um, We talked about this a little bit on one of the pods that we did. I don't know where we talked about this, but we're going to know everything that we need to know about Mississippi state on uh on the morning of sunday Jan- uh wednesday january 4th because next they get alabama on the 28th they don't play on new year's eve or new year's day and the next tuesday they get uh tennessee on the road we're gonna know all we need to know about them in those next two games it was a weird night overall in the sec texas a&m lost at home to wofford uh old miss lost at Man, home texas to a&m has been disappointing Te- texas a&m has been disappointing so I- I- I thought that they like, those were our down. sleepers to what the hell's going on here yeah, I thought Texas A&M was going to take their typical, what was it, third year, fourth year jump under Buzz. And they just I don't like – I am I get bad juju from A&M. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious. What are they, six and six? Yeah, I just think – and I hate to say it like this, but I think Buzz is sort of an all-or-nothing guy. I think I think when his teams are clicking, it really can click. But I, I also think Buzz – I think Buzz Williams might have peaked early in his coaching career. I'm sorry, I just do. I hate to be I hate to be pointed here in my remarks. I also think Texas Say that again, you went out. I think Texas A&M's a hard job. Yeah, it is, and it's not easy to go into the SEC, but it it was kind of shaping up for him to to have this be the year, right? Everything was kind yeah. of pointing to this. It's like it builds, it builds, it builds, it builds, it builds and then boom, he has this great season right here. Um the only thing I don't want to have happen is Texas A&M to go on some like 13 game winning streak after they start the season six and 10. So we have to hear again about how they have to expand the NCAA tournament because uh, Texas, Texas A&M won 13 games in the SEC, but still found a way to lose 14 games on the season. So that's the only thing that I'm rooting for. Yep. Can I hear that? I won't hear that because you can't lose at home to Wofford. Right. No. It can't happen with an, inter- with an interim coach too. Like it's not even it's not even Mike Young's Wofford. It's Wofford. No, it's not a great Wofford team. It's it's just I don't know. They, they, that's the thing. The top of the SEC is excellent. The bottom and the and the middle even aren't as as good as we thought it was. And so that's why the SEC might only get six teams the NCAA tournament. 
Uh-huh. Now, now they're six teams. This is where the math gets interesting because you might only have six teams, but you probably have four that can make the second weekend. I'd probably rather have four that can make the second weekend than get eight or nine teams in and only have one or two in the second weekend. So, so you're saying you'd rather be the SEC than the Big Ten is what you're saying to me, right? Absolutely. Now. I still think the SEC is a better league than the Big Ten. Do you think the yeah. Big Ten's a better league than the SEC? No. I don't think so. Not at the top. No. Hey, by the way, I'm just scrolling through scores right now. Utah Valley is up 49 to 35 on Oregon. At oh, Oregon. my God. What is going on in Oregon? That's two years in a row where it's been yeah, like kind of crazy. I don't think they like each other. After they had made a bunch of tournaments in a row. Is, yeah. is Dana Altman – could Dana Altman be the next head coach at Texas? I don't know. I don't know if you can uh, hire a guy that had the scandal that Oregon had about eight years ago at a place that's trying to that that's dealing with some of those issues already. I'm not ready for this right now. Like I'm just not ready for. Uh, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for this yeah, conversation. We, what did we have? What did we have? What did we have last year? When I said I can't do this today, that's when oh. I on the first on the first day of games I said Palo was the best prospect at Duke. Oh, Which, it was it was after Champions Classic, and you said Palo was the best player that Duke's ever had. And nah, I like, said best prospect that Duke's ever yeah, had. I can't. No, do you said player. Best no, player. no, no, no. We can go back and look. You said when, wait, no, you, so whatever this, whatever it was, it was it was. It wasn't was like, incorrect. I can't do this. I it can't still do this. is incorrect, and Fanta was right. We oh, couldn't. in other news, Louisville lost tonight to Lipscomb. Hey, hey, Lenny Acuff, shout out to the Bison, Lenny Acuff, and, and Lipscomb. <laughs> hey, Lenny Acuff can coach his ass off. You think uh, I'm playing? I believe with you? it's. I believe it's the Bisons, sir. No, the Bisons. No. It's it, Lipscomb is the Bisons. It's plural. Yes, it is. Why is Bisons in plural? Like wait, wait, Bison. All well, right. Yeah, yeah, I, bet no, bison, deers. I bet you say deers. I bet you say deers. Lipscomb is the bison's. You can look it up. <laughs> you Lipscomb is the bison's. Us. Yeah, I, I'm going to take this W. Yeah, hey, oh listen, listen, T.O. Hey, hey, as many pirates. losses as you take, Rob, like you need to take them where you can get them. So I, I'll, <laughs> give it to you. I'll give it to you. <laughs> we, only have, we only have three minutes, so take it wherever you want. Yeah, we've got three <laughs> minutes here. Yuli's been asking in the chat who we like tomorrow night. So who do we got? North Carolina and Michigan. Who wins in Charlotte? I like Carolina. Is it Charlotte? Yeah. Carolina. Yeah, but I like Carolina too. I think they're playing better. And I, I, I still like Carolina. I mean, like, they've been a selfish team. Sometimes scheduling works out in your favor. I feel like I've said that three times a day. I probably have. But uh, scheduling works out in your favor sometimes. And the, and the positive of playing so many difficult games in a row in your non-conferences, it, ex- it expedites your learning curve as to what your problems are. And North Carolina in the early part of the season was a selfish team. Now they're figuring out how to play together. They're moving the ball a little bit more. That talent's still there. And then you have uh, Pete Nance hit a massive shot against Ohio State. But 24 assists against the Citadel. They're starting to play with some rhythm, starting to play with some pace, starting to figure it out. And Armando Baycott is back and healthy. Those things help. I think Carolina is still going to be really good, and they could be dangerous in March. Villanova hosting St. John's. This is a validation game for both teams. For St. John's, it's a chance to show America that the 11-1 and start to the season is not actually a fluke, that they are an NCAA tournament caliber team. If you go to the main line and win, it doesn't matter who, what, when, where, why. St. John's would be proving something if they could do that. The line is four and a half. In this one, for Villanova, they've won four in a row. Cam Whitmore has been a game changer. You're going for five in a row tomorrow night. It seems like the Cats have had signs of life here. They're playing better basketball. They've got the fewest turnovers per game in the country. Contrasting styles, a critical game for both teams, and a real opportunity for St. John's to show something. Rob, who wins? Uh, well, I mean, Villanova's going to win. You know, like the St. John's is not going in there and and – and beating them. It's just, that's just not going to happen. But you've, you've buried the lead here, right? One of the biggest games of the college basketball season is happening tomorrow. And you didn't even mention it. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm a little disappointed that, uh, that, that you didn't bring this up. This is normally the kind of thing that you pick up on. Cal is hosting UT Arlington. This is their last non-conference game. If Cal does not win this game, they head into Pac-12 play completely winless. And based off of what they've done so far this season, 
I don't know if you really want to go into Pac-12 play completely with. They it. still they they still play Oregon. They still play Oregon. They still play Oregon State. Hey man, look the oh, bottom or, of the pack, oh. the bottom of the wait. Pack what did you mean? Which, the, wait a if minute. Cal, if Cal doesn't win this game, then then they, there's like there's a chance yeah. that they could not go win this. Dagan, I know we got like a minute if we even have any more time left in the show. No, we don't. We've been done for. I was a while. gonna say like I was gonna say uh, let's just wrap it up. But I mean, whatever. Dagan, Dagan, how about the fact, Dagan, that I give this great lead for Villanova <laughs> St. John's. The content tomorrow, you know, you could feasibly yeah. put out who's going to win this game, right? Yeah, like, it's an course. interesting game. It's one of the few great games tomorrow night. Uh, and he, he takes the preview and says, what about Cal? I do agree, though. <laughs> Cal, we do. We should talk about Cal. I may make well, look, I, you don't even need my response because the beauty of that was the intro. Like, nobody needs anything else once you get past that. that all it was was the intro. So, so, wait, they're taking on UT Arlington. And can I just say, for, go, can I just say for the Villanova. record, I'm going to go, go back Mavericks. to the Villanova. I'm going to go back to the Villanova game for Good a second. Call on the mascot there. When we get, I wouldn't, when, I wouldn't have guessed that they were the Mavericks. Yeah, they were the Mavericks. When we get back to Villanova, right? It's Maverick. If and when, if and when Justin Moore gets back, right? If you can give me Justin Moore, Caleb Daniels, Eric Dixon, Cam Whitmore, and Brandon Slater. Name me. Assuming Justin Moore is back at about eighty percent of his health. But, how yeah. many? How many? How many teams in the Big East are more talented than that five? Maybe two. You maybe, yeah, yep. Period. Yeah, maybe two. Mm-hmm. You, I would take that five over Creighton's five. Yeah. Yep. Look, Pro- maybe that. two. Maybe two. I'm bullish on one team. I'm not gonna get into it tonight. But I. But I. Because I really like one team. Oh no! no. Dig that hole. Is it Providence? No. No. Yeah. No. I actually. I actually think I'm their very best night. I, I think on their very best night, on their very best night, Xavier is a team that can be that. I said on their very best night three times because I still believe in Xavier. I think I think Sean's going to get them. When the calendar turns to February, I guarantee you, Terrence, Sean Miller will, and he's not going to do this, he'll go jump off a of Cincinnati bridge before his team uh, starts defending. Like, in other words, his team is going to defend. He's going to give an ultimatum. Either that team's going to wake up defensively or he's he's not going to keep coaching them. He is going to make them fucking defend. You you actually just said that Sean Miller is going to jump off the bridge before his team starts defending, which would, to me, which imply would already jump. that it's going to take Sean Miller jumping off a bridge no. for Xavier to start defending. And please, Sean, I know you're a big, avid listener of the field of 68 After Dark, and I know that you were on the show last year Please don't jump off a bridge. We like you around. <laughs> no, here. no, no. No one's just, jumping. You just off got on bridge. the wrong side. You're on, you're on the right side of the M- the NCAA now. You just got past that whole ordeal. You got this great job. Xavier fans I'm love saying, you. The future is bright for Sean Miller. You don't need to jump off that bridge. Okay. I'm saying they're and we back. all need to be here. Look, Arch is going through some tough times too. Like he's not defending the free throw line like he used to be. Right. We need you here, Sean. No jumping off bridges, please. I'm saying they're going to defend. And that was my right. TED talk. Yeah, they're going to defend it. They're going to defend at some point. Terrence, you haven't said a word. Any any last words here ahead of ahead of us taking however many days off? Merry Christmas. Yep. Happy Hanukkah. Whatever yep. holiday I'm missing, happy it to you. And enjoy your families. Enjoy your loved ones. Let's get out of here, boys. Let me let me end with this, folks. <laughs> Let me end with this. I did this in our December 23rd show, but I'm going to do it live for all the listeners now. Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The boilermakers were rolling and steaming ahead while visions of offense filled John Calipari's head. Shire and Duke are rolling too. Watch out for the Hurleys. And Arkansas, woo. Goodman came down the chimney and made Christmas special. And if Dalster keeps putting mayo on his steak, he's going straight to hell. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. Enjoy it with your loved ones, your family, your friends. Have some alcohol. Watch some college basketball. And folks, make a lot of love. We'll see you 